Happy Thursday, friends. Welcome to this edition of the Mystery Wine Blind Tasting Experience with the Field and Main Tasting Crew. We are going to be tasting what looks to be a, thanks to the gigantic amount of humidity in this room, a sweaty white. Um, a summertime white, perhaps. So who's with us? Who's doing this tonight? Isabel, always within the top one or two. Chiming in, thank you so much. Glad to have you. Hi, Anne. How are you? Great to have you with us. Mm. Mm. Who else is here tonight? Mm. Jan's with us. Yes, you sent you dispatched Bobby earlier today to pick up the wine. He did a good job seeing as you're here now with the wine. Hi, Melanie. Welcome. Trans with us. Hey, man. How are you? And Rick, hello, sir. Kristen's here too. Kristen and Johnny, great. Welcome. Rebecca's with us. Al, thank you for joining us. Hmm, this is going to be an interesting one. Julia is running downstairs now to, to make some drinks, and she said she's going to miss out on seeing my reaction to this wine, which is some indication that we're going to be in for quite a treat tonight. Uh, she said she also teased you guys with the uh, idea that this is a summertime white, so she's giving me that much of a hint. Um, yeah, Tran, last week was crazy. Um, it was awesome. It was crazy because there's no varietal blend out there that is known as Tanat Merlot Zin, the TMZ. Hmm. Um, the TMZ blend is not one that is universally yet been embraced, but everybody enjoyed the wine, so perhaps more and more around the world will begin to make the, that kind of blend. But what was really cool about last week is that as a group, we were all nipping at the individual components, and most of us thought it was a blend, although we couldn't identify the specific blend. Um, we were getting close to the actual varietals. There was a camp that was all Tanat, there was a camp that was for Merlot, there was a camp that was for Zinfandel, um, and there was a definite camp, uh, which I was in, that was kind of a GSM blend, and so we were, we were kind of, as a collective, I think we would have scored enough points to kind of get close, and so that's what's really cool about this group right now, is that the, the group is doing a great job of, of bringing forth a bunch of different ideas and perspectives that when put, especially in the collective, creates for a pretty close to near ace on all of these wines, which is great. So, Sharon, welcome. Kathy, hello. Melissa, welcome, welcome. Candy, uh, TNZ, Tony, yes. Candy, I completely agree, that's right. Uh, he, I think he delighted in putting that one in the mix, for sure. So um, we've got this week, this beautiful white that's before us. Next week, um, next week, is it next week? Next week, I think I put Tony, Tony in the hot seat. So I picked a little wine for next week and I'm gonna sit with him next week and we'll hang out together. He won't know, I will. I'll be probing all of you with some questions and him and we'll kind of have him work the program. That'll be a lot of fun to do that together. Hi Erica, hello. It's been all of a day since we've seen you, so wonderful to, to have you back uh, and this program. Thanks for bringing in friends last night. All right, folks, what do you say we get started? This is a white wine. Is it clear or hazy? Is, uh, is that, perception of the appearance pale, medium, deep, and would you call it sort of lemon, gold, or amber? Where do you put this wine in terms of appearance? What are you seeing? Jen, I completely concur. It's a white wine. I think that's right. Um, hi, Susan. Welcome. So this is a clear wine, right? It has a kind of a pale complexion to it. Maybe a little bit medium, but pretty pale, right? There's, depending on the, if you're looking over a white piece of paper, like I'm trying to do right now, um, it's more pale, right? It's, but it's got a, kind of for the center core, a little bit of a medium element to it, but it's, it's mostly pale. Lemon, pale, medium, and everybody seems to concur with that. So yeah, it's clear, pale, um, lemony quality. How about the aroma? Is it clean? Anything kind of funky coming off? And then what is coming off? Susan, you're getting some spritzy bubbles? Mine didn't, but it was decanted, so I don't know if that's the case because it just kind of 
aerated out um, as it was decanted, so I don't know what is in the actual bottle or the shape of the bottle or the capsule of the bottle, which many of you have used in the past to help you get to a good guess. Um, but yeah, it's clean. Um, and I don't see any indication of spritz, but it might be a little bit on the palate. It could just be such a fresh wine that it has a little um, uh, SO2 in it, and that's kind of in suspension, and when we opened it, it just sort of blew off. And I'm sorry, I'm missing some of the points that you're making, but almond from Rick, a little bit of effervescence for Rina, lemons for Tran, lots and lots of citrus, so much citrus. Yep. Candy, I agree. Clean with some grassiness, no oak smell, sweet citrus for Jan. So when you're smelling a whole bunch of citrus like this, what, uh, what jumps to mind immediately? What, what do you have to consider by way of the citrus? Especially when you have no oak. Sauvignon Blanc would be one of those, and gr grassiness is, is thrown out there, right? So, Kathy's throwing out super ripe citrus, passion fruit, beeswax, cool. Perfume and a little floral element from Tran, nice, okay. Um, tropical mango quality from Karina, cool. A little lees element from Susan. Melanie's thrown out Sancerre as a potential. Yeah, if we're gonna talk about Sauvignon Blanc, we're gonna to have to talk about Sancerre in that context for sure. So that's one thing that's running. It's pretty minerally to me. So from the fruit side, a lot of citrus that we're getting, right? And some tropical elements. How about the earth inside? Few, fruit, earth, wood. Kelly, you're getting citronella, that's a cool one. Um, and uh, indicative of some of that sort of citrus quality and uh, an almost, um, <coughs> excuse me, a concentration of that citrus. Um, hi, Christine. How are you? Sorry, I don't have the wine this week, but I'm glad you're with us. Tons of mineral, right? For me, there's a, 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 a crushed stone, stone quality, wet stone uh, element that's pleasant and present. <laughs> Kathy's getting some flint, yep. Wow, yeah, cool. What else, anything, uh, one candy, I think you said that there, you didn't see any or sense any wood elements. Swanbergs are with us with mineral and citrus. Charlie's throwing out their unoak shard. Yeah, some of that tropical quality could be accounted for in an unoak shard, and so this could be something like Chablis, for example, perhaps, where you have that minerality. Um, that would be kind of neat, right? So. Sometimes Chablis will also give you a little bit of the, uh, more of a green apple quality than the tropical element, but un oak Chardonnay could be for sure in the running. Isabel's throwing out Albarino as well. Rick, you're getting some orange rind. That's interesting. Anybody else getting kind of a muskiness? There's a little bit of that wet stone, but... I'm getting just a tiny hint of kind of... Uh, I don't know, almost a uh, wet basement floor. Which, Kathy, you're saying is beeswax, huh? Okay, that's cool. Neat. Let's, um... Hmm. Beeswax. It's neat. There is a little bit of waxiness, yeah, candle quality. Um, okay. So let's see what we can confirm by way of the nose on the palate. What, uh, what do you get on the palate? And does it come out with the citrus? Does it come out with what we would assume would be pretty much high acid because of the uh, aromas and the quality of, of the fruit that we're getting? Hmm. Hmm. Wow, that's a zinger, huh? It's got a lot of fruit. Yeah, Kathy, exactly. That's kind of what my, my brain is wrapping around. Kathy notes that it's really high acid, but super ripe. And not a lot of grapes have that combination. Tons of acid. Robert, you're getting green apple, huh? That's, like I said earlier, kind of a tell for Chablis um, with some good acid for sure. Uh, 
so what else we got here? Let's talk about the tastes. High acid, is it a dry wine? I'm not getting any residual sugar, right? So it's not like this has the tropical flavors, the high acid and some residual sugar like we might find in Riesling, for example. Uh, Jen's picking up wild honeysuckle, wax. Um, Charlie's saying she gets a waxiness on whites and that's an expression of tannins. Um, and yeah, Erica, it's definitely got some tartness. A little salinity, yeah, the Swanbergs, uh, Jeff, for sure. Uh, and it's definitely dry. Um, Jen's noting a happy birthday for Amanda. Yes, indeed, happy birthday for sure. Um, Melissa's saying it's tart, definitely dry. There is a saline element. There's like, when you have a saline solution, saline water, or if when you put salt water from the sea in your mouth, there's that roundness to it. The salt gives density to the water and, and there's this, there's a density to this wine that is also what I think maybe Kathy's referring to in, in terms of ripeness. There's this, there's a lushness to this. It's pretty neat. Um, and the saline quality sort of amplifies flavor anyway. So that's cool. Uh, so maybe we're talking, you know, Albarino is thrown out there and Albarino being more maritime from say somewhere like Rias Baixas. You know, we've done this like 19 or 20 times and I don't remember if we've done Albarino yet. So um, the hive may perhaps know better than I do. Um, if we've done Albarino, then we can't really say Albarino because I don't think we're trying to repeat. But if we haven't, then it should be there. Chris, you're saying passion fruit. Yeah, that's neat. And passion fruit, like in the true sense of kind of passion fruit, not in the sort of confectionery sense where a lot of sugar's added to it. It's got more of that tartness, that passion fruit acidity is crazy high, uh, which enables pastry cooks to use a ton of sugar with passion fruit to kind of even that out. And so the flavor is really that tartness. Um, so where do we get passion fruit? I don't know. Um, Melanie, I think it's tart, more tart than Albarino, as opposed to not tart enough. This has plenty of tartness and it has a lemon element. A lot of Albarino I get has some kind of element of the pear to it, like a little pear quality, but um, I'm not getting that in this case. But Isabel, I think what you're saying is really fascinating and very possible here in a Certico, um, which is really cool because it definitely has maritime minerality, has high acid, and it can have texture and you get warmth, so you get ripeness. Um, Kathy's thrown in Italy or Greece, and so the Assertico from Greece would be a great option here, um, and certainly checks off a number of, of what we're thinking about here. So Kathy and Isabel are on, onto something I think that is a, a really good option in the form of the Assertico. Um, this has that salinity, right? I mean, Assertico coming from a Grecian island, um, Santorini principally, right, would be surrounded by the maritime influence of salty water and, and a mineral-based soil composition. It would have um, a lot of that citrus quality because you'd get some high-ranging acid from the grape acertico, and then you'd get the warmth of the Mediterranean and you'd get some of the tropical quality. Um, Vanessa is saying, yeah, she thinks Mediterranean. Chris, Semyon. We absolutely should consider Semillon, especially because we've got a lot of votes for lime and some of that lemon, the textures there. Um, I'm not sure if the saline quality would be quite the same and that kind of amplitude in the, in the mouth. It's usually much more precise. It's much more like a razor's edge. Um, and Rick's noting volcanic soil. And as I said, it reminds you of your honeymoon in Santorini, which is an awesome tell right there. If you've had that experience, then you probably are more versed in this than anybody else by way of that taste memory um, fortified by, of course, the fond memories of a honeymoon. So, hmm. Any indication of wood? We didn't get much on the nose. Anything on the palate? Anything spice? So, or do you think this is more neutral vessel? Old barrels, perhaps, or stainless steel? What are you tasting? Mm. Wow, that's awesome. Let's spend a moment here. Hey, Foxes, hello. No worries for being a little late. Catch up, to just to catch you up and to recap for everybody else. 
it's a white wine, summery white, <clears throat> high acid, no wood profile on the nose or on the palate. It's pale lemon in color. And we've been talking about lemon, lime, passion fruit, tropical flavor. Um, <clears throat> and this has a salinity to it. Um, this is ocean forward. Yes, that's what, that's what we're saying too. There's a salinity to it that gives an amplitude to the actual middle palate of the wine and the experience there. A longer finish, mostly drive, driven by the taste as opposed to the flavors, but it is it's a pretty wine. Hi, Bob. Um, and we're kind of saying Greece, Spain, Italy, like you're just noting there. In particular, Assertico from Greece is jumping on there. Um, and Chris is noting a white wine on IPA day. There you go. Uh, a little bit of honey quality coming through. Yeah, that's neat. Um, I'm not getting a whole bunch of other wood characteristic um, on this particular wine. It's relatively well balanced, even though it is super racy. Um, and hi, Gary. How are you? Gary joining Christine tonight. That's awesome. Um, all right, so let's talk about this for, for a second, uh, just because the texture of the wine is one thing, the taste of the wine is one thing, and the flavors of the wine are one thing. Let's break this one down just so that we have something to talk about in the context of this, um, this particular wine in terms of its palate, right? So it's dry, it has a high acidity, you know, low to low tannin. It has what kind of alcohol? Um, Isabel, to your question about Riesling, yeah, it's, Riesling's high in acid, but um, oftentimes it would be residual sugar, and we would get some more potentially Riesling tells. I mean, some of the tropical elements could be there. This could very well be dry Riesling. Um, the minerality could be expressed in that way. We got uh, some sort of flintiness, which could be the slate. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't say that you would necessarily rule out um, Riesling. In fact, as we're looking for the profile for this wine, right? And that's what I'm kind of talking about right now, the profile of this wine being dry, high acid, probably moderate alcohol, not super high, right? You're not getting any burn kind of retro nasally, right? It's not, when you swallow a little bit, the heat that kind of comes back up when you have a shot of a vodka or tequila or something of that sort, you don't feel that in this. So it's more medium alcohol, right? And so it's not super ripe. Um, yeah, and Carrie is putting it 11.5 11, 11, to 13. We got 13, 13, 5 perhaps. So we're kind of in the, the average moderate range and let's define that, right? So if a Riesling that's Cabernet, Spate Laser perhaps is at seven, eight, nine, ten 10% alcohol, that would be on the low alcohol side of things. 11%, 11, 5 really probably and up to maybe 13, 5, 14 um, would be, uh, be a great medium range and then sort of 13, 5, 14, probably 14 plus would be heavy alcohol. And some of those wines that we've tried before have 14.5 and they wear them extremely well, but they're still more on the high alcohol side of things. And sometimes you've got a 13.6, 13.7 wine that just has some heat. So um, that's kind of neat. And I agree, Isabel, it's, Julie and Tony did a great job with this particular wine. Uh, this is a really fun wine to try and to drink. Uh, I, they didn't furnish me tonight with a spit cup, so I'm not spitting, I'm just drinking. And this is okay by me. And Melissa, you're with, uh, you're at, uh, you're at the lake. Oh, awesome. That's really cool. Cheers to that. Um, so with that profile, there's certain grapes that we probably shouldn't consider, right? And there's certain grapes that we absolutely must. Like when we first started smelling this wine and based on the color and a little bit of grassiness and the citrus quality and the mineral element uh, that we got, the stoniness, uh, we were thinking about Sauvignon Blanc. We were also then thinking about Assertico as it came on and Riesling. Those three varietals kind of popped up. Um, and don't think Vermentino or Verdicchio. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think the Vermentino and Verdicchio have a little bit less acid than this, a little bit lower acid, a little bit more um, um, richness uh, coming in the way of those wines overall, a, a heaviness. So where does this hit your palate? And Kathy, we'll come back to your, your call. I think it's a, a very good one. Um, but as you're tasting this, is this skim milk? Is this 2% milk? Is this whole milk? So is this a full bodied wine? Is this a moderate bodied wine? Is it a light bodied wine? And usually that, that indication dovetails nicely with the overall alcohol weight. So if there is a higher alcohol weight, it's probably more robust, generally speaking. 
because robustness usually comes from the alcohol and the alcohol is derived from sugar. So you could have a low alcohol wine with a high amount or amount of residual sugar, which gives you a richness and a roundness. So it's the potential alcohol either formed in the way of full fermentation that makes it dry or in some residual sugar left over that can give you a richness. Um, and that can be an indication of where it's coming from and also potentially the varietal. But this, uh, this wine is more moderate all the way through, right? So it's not necessarily one that is deriving uh, a whole bunch of warmth. It's definitely tempered. Um, and so you get a potential alcohol that's probably in the moderate range, which is what we're saying. And the texture in the wine follows suit. So these are ways you can link the two things together. Hmm. Eric, I 100% agree. I wouldn't have uh, expected the density of this wine based on just the nose or the appearance. But this wine, there's some wines to me that, that sheet and that are lighter in body. And by sheet, I mean like a thin layer of water in your mouth, right? There's no viscosity, there's no volume. This one sort of enters and already it has a volume and a density. So you're gonna have volume, think of like cotton candy in your mouth, tons of volume, but no density. This wine expands in the mouth, has a heaviness to it, has a, has a power to it, and is a core density that goes from the first part of the sip all the way to the end. I mean, it's blocky, and um, that's neat. This wine is light and vibrant in its acidity, but it is not super strong. Um, but it is not super, uh, super wispy. You know, it has a dense core to it, which is really neat. Um, Kevin saying no to grease via candy. Um, candy asking why. Uh, and then Albarino being a potential option, but the minerality takes Susan away from the Albarino and more into volcanic soil, which would be more akin to what you'd find perhaps in Greece. Um, so she's joining Kathy in her Grecian call. And Isabel, I understand your call or your desire for more of a seafood oriented option for dinner. Yeah, this kind of textured white, this is, um, this is high toned white and textured white, which is really fascinating, it gives you a lot of options. This would be great with something like grilled squid, for example, where you've got some chewy texture. Um, scallops, ceviches, where you have the texture of that raw transforming uh, fish. And Karina, yeah, 100% with your red snapper, absolutely. Um, I think we're all kind of coming, well, not all, but many of us, uh, are coming to, to Greece with this particular choice. And I think that would be a very good call. So let's talk for a second though about Sauvignon Blanc and then uh, Riesling, why it wouldn't be the two, one of the, either, either two of those. We had talked initially about saying we should consider Sancerre. So why is this not Sancerre? Hmm. Is it just a little bit too ripe for Sancerre? Yeah, got these noting not many grapes with this acidity and ripeness. I mean, some Sancerres are getting a, a lot riper, and so it would be interesting if this was Sancerre. The minerality's there. I don't think you could be kind of faulted for saying this could be a ripe vintage Sancerre um, because of the, the brightness, the acidity, the... Uh, the minerality. So Isabel, I agree with you there. It's, um, you could make the case. I don't know that it's the strongest case per what Chris is noting. The tartness on this wine um, isn't akin to sort of Sauvignon Blanc acidity. There's usually more of that fresh spritz quality and this is just more almost vinegary uh, acidity. I mean, it's just, it's got a purity to it. It's a, a distillate kind of acidity uh, as opposed to just sort of a fresh acidity. Um, and we got a little hint of that grassiness first off and it's kind of gone away and the passion fruit element that uh, we picked up on is not necessarily an indicator of, of Sauvignon Blanc typically. Yeah, Kathy's just making that note. Um, <laughs> Jen, you'd love to pair this with Hood Coast Oysters. I have no doubt that any of us would be enjoy, would enjoy joining you in that experience. Yeah, these, this piercing acidity would be so fun with uh, you know, in lieu of kind of a spritz of lemon on an oyster, just let this be the acid. 
And so one of the things you can certainly do with food and wine matching, when you're looking for acid, let the wine be the acid on the dish, re remove it from the dish, and then the acid will carry through from the wine into the dish. If you were to put like a spritz of lemon on that oyster and then have this, it would downplay the acidity of both the lemon and of the wine. So if you didn't want that acidity or that acidic experience, you could add acidity to the dish and watch it kind of downplay a little bit. Um, the green apple element's not there as prominent at this point, was picked up a tiny bit, Chris is noting that. So that might happen in Sauvignon Blanc. That might also happen in, say, Chablis and Chardonnay. So we were thinking about Sancerre, we were thinking about the minerality taking us over to Chablis and an unoaked Chardonnay, for example. And then we're also thinking about Riesling. So I don't think the, the Chardonnay would necessarily have this high an acid. And that salinity in particular took us more coastal. Um, and that's where I think we would also diverge potentially from Riesling. I didn't get any petrol elements and I didn't get um, sort of the, the quality of, uh, of acidity that you might associate with Riesling, although Riesling can have a, a super high acid. So I don't think you'd lose major points by saying, you know, dry Riesling. Potentially, you could argue a case for um, warmer vintage um, Chablis. And you can certainly talk a little bit, arguably, about um, a Sancerre Sauvignon Blanc and maybe even just more of a Touraine Sauvignon Blanc so that uh, you wouldn't have sort of that precision. But um, Chris is also putting out Malvasia, and he had already noted Semillon Sauvignon Blanc blend. I'm not getting much in the way of a variety here. Uh, I, don't, I don't see a blend uh, personally, but it could be a blend like, you know, if you were taking Sauvignon Blanc in a percentage and Semillon in another percentage, um, Entre de Mer, for example, from, from Bordeaux, giving you that kind of percentage. Um, and Jeff's asking about the Middle East. That's a good question. Um, I just don't know that the Middle East would, uh, would give you the warmth. Would it give you the acidity? I'm not positive. And would it give you the saline element that we're picking up on? Why isn't it Verdejo? That's a great question. Um, what can I give you? I, I, there's a little bit of Hmm. Not sure on the Verdejos that I've tried, and there haven't been a ton. Um, would the Verdejo give us this much tropical element? And would it give us the saline element? Um, not positive. Um, so you could make an argument for that too. Um, I'm more comfortable with where we've been with respect to Greece personally, but... Um, Candy's saying uh, that Kathy is old world Sauvignon Blanc. Um, no, I don't think so, right? So I think I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm comfortable, I think, with our assertico kind of Greek determination thus far. Um, and I think we worked our way through pretty comfortably. We were, we didn't even ask the question of new world, old world, but old world seems to be where we're sitting. Um, and in particular, we worked our way through then Sancerre, we worked our way through the uh, the um, potential for, I'm reading Nick, Rick's comment, excuse me, about Entre de Mer being an interesting thing. It's, so this is a Bordeaux bottle. We're seeing a Bordeaux bottle because I don't have the bottle in front of me. Uh, it's down here and I'm not looking at it intentionally so I don't get swayed by it. Um, but we worked our way through Sauvignon Blanc, Sancerre potentially, we worked our way through uh, Chablis, we worked our way through potentially Riesling. Um, there was some talk of Albarino, Verdejo, maybe a Semillon Sauvignon Blanc blend. Um, there's just this real minerality and the salinity here that, um, that I think I'd be pretty comfortable saying um, Assertico. Assertico is a grape that you'll find in Greece um, that has super high acidity is grown um, in a number of islands in Greece, most famously in Santorini, um, is grown on volcanic soil, um, is grown um, all surrounded by ocean, and has texture. It can have definite texture, can have neutral barrel, and can have stainless steel productions. In some cool places, they, they grow the vines up, and then they circle the vines to make sort of a nest. And then the cluster of grapes hangs in the inside of it because the the wind is so brutal uh, that you have just no ability for a vine to actually stake itself up to bush train or to be um, to be trellised 
either way because the grape clusters would just swing and, and so they've circled and piled the the vines up and, this, and around and then the cluster drops inside to be protected by the um, by that circle uh, or that nest of, of vine which is really neat um, question about California California could give us the ripeness but I'm not sure it would give us the vicinity and I'm not really sure um, that you get that minerality unless you're talking about something true coastal and I just don't know of a lot of true coastal like Sauvignon Blanc for example I don't know you would have an odd varietal perhaps grown on the California coast that way but I don't think so and um, wow yeah I agree Erica this is just delicious for sure hmm all right folks What's your final guess? What's your final statement? Where do you plant your flag? Assertico, Greece, 2018. That was Kathy's guess. Um, Kathy's jaunt, who else has one? Anybody diverging from that? I'm pretty comfortable with that personally. I think that's kind of where I want to go. Um, yeah, I think we're going to Greece. Provence from Katie, yeah. We could have an interesting Provence. I don't get, I mean, typically you'd get kind of a blend um, from Provence, but typically, right? And I'm not sure that I, I pick up a lot of dimension here from a, gland, uh, from a blend, but um, per the question of where, so I could just say Santorini, Greece, 2018 would be sort of my guess. Um, Rick, you're saying you're clueless as usual and it's not Virginia, so therefore you have at least some clue. Man, that acid just keeps building. Whew. Definitely not IPA. Um, all right. I'm on, on record. I'm going to say 18, Assertico, Greece, maybe Santorini. Yep. We're doing well here. Hey, Dave. How are you, sir? Welcome. Yes. This is a Santorini Assertico 2018. We did it. That's so good. And Carrie, I agree. We could definitely drink the whole bottle of this. This is a great property. They do a wonderful job. This wine is delicious. Year in and year out, we've had a number of them here and they're crowd pleasers. This is, um, we do have more of this, Erica, yes. We can, and we can get some more for you. This is a great bottle and goes with like we talked about, so many things from the the Red Snapper to um, to ceviches, which we have on tonight, just a, a little bit of, we got some great rockfish in tonight uh, for our present menu, which is our tasting menu. And um, Ryan made some watermelon gazpacho. So watermelon, lime juice, lemon juice, mix that with the, uh, with the, the rockfish and whew, some, some jalapenos, and then made some uh, yuca and beet chips it's pretty awesome. So this would be delicious with that. And I have a little bit left. I might go see if I can scrounge some and, and enjoy the two together. Um, Karina, this has been your favorite? Oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. And I've heard from a number of folks too in the past uh, couple weeks that this, this type of experience that we've been endeavoring for the last 20 weeks or so is cool for them because they wouldn't necessarily drink some of the wines we are, are tasting and they find that they really enjoy those wines and so it's broadening their palate and broadening the enjoyment that they can have uh, with wine so that's spectacular um ooh, erica nice yeah the cayenne sugar with the watermelon that's pretty much super fun wasn't it um watermelon gazpacho would be tremendous with this this is a great wine for the summertime and for all the produce and where it produce, because that tropical ripeness in this and that super high acid, you can play with things that have a super ripeness like a watermelon and then pair it with something that has a little acidity to it. You can have this, what about with a whole bunch of ripe peaches and our tomato salad that's right now. So tomatoes and, and this would be wonderful with super great sea salt cr cracked all over the top of it. Um, Christine for sure with red snapper would be awesome. Uh, salt crusted fish, baked and then pulled off, spritzed with a little bit of citrus. Wow, there's a lot of options for this particular wine. Robert, thanks for the, yeah, for the 
for emphasizing the, uh, the, the point I was just making. It's neat. It's great to try wines from different region, especially when you wouldn't necessarily try them. And to try them this way, I mean, we spend 35 minutes, 40 minutes each week really delving into it so that we have a chance to appreciate the wine and its nuances and its differences and its comparative qualities to other wines that we've had a chance to try. And that would be, that allows us, I think, to really broaden our palates. It's, for me, it's, it's been wonderfully helpful in getting a, a greater perception of wines. Um, and then working together is my favorite part because uh, I think 10 minutes in, you could probably look at my face and going, mm, I'm not positive. And then someone said grease and it was like, yep, a Certico, which happened uh, like the second or third week when we were tasting the Portuguese red. It was like someone said that and boom, um, that would be something I want to do. That's it. So. Kathy, thanks for noting the, the tasting menu. Yeah, we, we will always try to accommodate um, keto, low carb, dietary restrictions, things of that sort. And right now, we're just really fortunate to Rick's point. Uh, peaches are coming in. It's probably one of the best tomato seasons um, maybe ever. Uh, the folks over at the farm at Sunnyside have said, hey, um, we're pulling out thousands of pounds of, of tomatoes right now. The heat and the dryness have been great for tomatoes. Um, Jenna over at Whippoorwill is dropping off 30 pounds of them today to us because she just has this abundance and uh, we're going to basically be putting tomatoes on everything. So you'll see that in the next week or so as we transition our menu to reflect the, the bounty of tomatoes and peaches and uh, watermelons going to make its way onto the menu too in the form of a salad perhaps. And so fun time, fun times. Great to be with all of you as always and I will see you next week on Thursday with Tony in tow as we do a really neat red. And I'm, uh, as my wife will say, I'm really not good with surprises, so I'm gonna stop talking about it there, otherwise I might give something away. Christian made Sunnyside Farm salsa this week. Uh, it's, it's the joys of summer, like you get to revel in, in the bounty that is summertime. In winter, we have to be a little contemplative and more creative with the limitations, which I think can oftentimes present more really creative dishes. Uh, but in the summertime, it, the difficulty is to edit yourself, and sometimes it's best just to dump it all into a salsa and just enjoy every bit of it. Let the juices run down your mouth and, and go for it. So thank you for the thank yous. We will see you again next week. Cheers, everybody.